morning, everyone, and welcome to what seems to be a fascinating event. I mean, it's my first science and uh, cocktails, and I must say I'm one cocktail down already. <laughs> so hopefully I keep it together for the remaining duration of the talk. And uh, we on, since this is the orbit, we're going to be on one big orbital journey today. And it's a bliss going through several thousands year of years of our human history, and hopefully you'll be on that journey with me. So I've entitled this presentation appropriately, The Root to Roots, and my toolkit for this evening's presentation is the power of the DNA that every single one of us carries in every single cell in our body. Well, if you have been paying attention to some of the slides that preceded the event, you'd have seen that there were many questions posed, and I was not privy to that information prior to coming to here. And so the first slide speaks to the issue of how is it that we as humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, have come to populate the entire globe? And it's an exotic journey having its roots right here in Africa, and we can argue where in Africa did this journey begin. And given our proximity to the cradle of humankind and the recent publicity of Lee Berger and Homo naledi and, and, and that very exotic fossil heritage that we have here, I would hope to convince you by the end of the day that in fact Southern Africa is a very good contender for our geographic region of origin of our own species, Homo sapiens sapiens. So it is a story, and there are several narratives that we can glean from concerning our past. And, and we start off by listening to stories from our grandparents and our forebears, and the narratives can be from oral history of traditions passed from one generation to the next, we have other toolkits like archaeology, anthropology, paleontology, and all of them contribute something about our information of the past, but at various points back into history. And to kind of animate the storytelling, and this is what this is, storytelling of reading the instructions or the, the, the paragraphs from the book, which is our genome. And here we have, in any region, a family sitting and talking about their past. And Gogo is telling her family how she and her family have come to be in a particular place. So that's the oral history. And of course, there are a few young bucks who've been educated and explored the academic world and start to say, well, you know, there are some other narratives that we can learn from. And that's the narrative of the genes, the DNA, the building block of the core of every, every one of us. And, and because I'm going to be talking about different types of genetic markers, I just want to remind everyone that the biological material that we talk about is contained in two structures in the cell, the nucleus and the mitochondria. Now, the DNA that we have in the nucleus is partitioned in the various chromosomes. Humans have 46 chromosomes, so 23 pairs. Number chromosomes 1 to 22 are the autosomes, and then there's a pair of sex chromosomes. Females have two copies of an X that make us female, and this one, of course, the carrier type is that of a male because of the presence of the Y chromosome. Now, in my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on mitochondrial DNA, which is located in the mitochondria, which over evolutionary time started off probably as a prokaryotic bacteria, and as systems of bacteria got more and more evolved in their uh, um, uh, delivery of what they actually did in terms of function, this organizational structure became much, much more complex in eukaryotes, and so we have reminiscence of another genome line in every single cell of ours. 
But there's something interesting about inheritance of mitochondria, that it is passed from mother to children, both sons and daughters, but only the daughters will pass it on, and so on and so on. So, so this mitochondrial DNA affords us the opportunity of looking at genetic variation exclusively along mother's lines. Mother's, 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 mother, to some point back in the past. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular molecule. And then I'm going to talk about Y chromosomes a little bit, which all males have. And in the same way like mitochondria, the Y chromosome is passed from father to, father to sons. So we have two streams of information that allow us to reconstruct history in the past exclusively along those lines. Now there's another reason why these molecules are so useful in these types of studies, because they do not undergo reshuffling or exchange of genetic elements called recombination. So the absence of recombinations allows us the opportunity of studying the history of change over time. Whereas the chromosomal DNA, oops, uh, these can exchange genetic segments, introducing diversity. So it becomes a little bit more difficult to understand the evolutionary history of a particular segment over time because the mixing and the reshuffling can re rearrange the ordering of this genetic segment. However, they lend themselves amenable to other types of genetic t studies. So for the main focus of this talk is going to rely on the value of using mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA in a valuable tool reconstructing the past. The difference between genetic, a genetic approach towards understanding the past as opposed to the paleontological one, like the fossil heritage that, we, that we've been exposed to, is that the genetic approach studies the living. So from the present, all of us in this room can be surveyed, and if we, for example, using mitochondrial DNA, which both males and females would have inherited from their mother, it would be possible to relate the different lineages or branches from a tree that we all would be uh, associated on to some point back in the past. So that common point we would call the most recent common ancestor. Now, in the popular press, people could not resist the temptation to bring in the usage of mitochondrial Eve. Uh, there are certain problems with that, and I prefer not to use that terminology because it sends out the wrong message. The most recent common ancestor for mitochondrial DNA is estimated to be around 150,000 years, which is in, in conflict with the biblical use of the term. And so, so when I talk about the coming together or the coalescent at a point back in history, we're talking about the most recent common ancestor. And there are a few things I want to emphasize from that, that it is connecting the divergent, the various dif the different patterns we see in living people today to some point back in the past. Now, there were other women who existed at the time, but their mitochondrial lineages kind of went extinct at some point, so much so that it didn't make it to the present. Now, extinction can happen for a number of reasons. If there was one particular pattern, uh, and say that woman had, didn't have children, it may not have passed, or she could have just had sons, they won't pass it, or she could have just been walking merrily somewhere and doof something, conked her out and took her out, so that lineage would have been annihilated as well. So, so extinctions can happen for a number of reasons, not contributing to what we see in the present day. So, so that's just to understand that process. Now, when we compare nuclear DNA to matrilineal inheritance, the biology is simple. As individuals, we have parents, they have parents, our grandparents, and they have parents, our great-grandparents, and so on and so on and so on. When it comes to our nuclear DNA or the chromosomal DNA, we share contributions from many, 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 many ancestors. So if you're going back 
four generations, it's two times two, that's four, eight, 16. You have 16 ancestors. Five generations, that's 32 ancestors who could potentially contribute to your chromosomal DNA. However, if you're talking about mitochondrial DNA, because it's only coming through the mother's line, at five generations, it's still one ancestral line. Next generation, still one, but it becomes 64 contributors to our autosomal DNA. So it's very important to understand the kind of reductionist uh, pathway back into the past using the different types of DNA. And we can get information about geography much better tracing maternal lines and similarly the paternal lines, but that's only in males. So usually people complain to me when they come for genetic ancestry tests, particularly the women, and they accuse me of being discriminatory yet again that I only afford one ancestral lineage for testing in women, whereas men get two. So you'll see why. So the process is, is very, very simple. As we say, every single cell in your body has this almost identical genetic information. And whether you take a blood sample or a hair sample or a cheek swab or scraping from under your nail or whatever the case may be, you're going to get a representation of your biological blueprint. And once we obtain the DNA, we subject it to various laboratory uh, methodologies to purify the DNA and then target the specific areas that we're interested in till we get down to the basic, the A's, C's, G's, and T's that when strung together makes up the words or the narrative of the story. Now when you put all of that together, there's a very, very interesting pattern. If you had a box of Smarties and you shook it, Every single color that is in that Smartix box will be in Africa. So Africa has the full monty of the different colors that's in your Smarty box. But if you're a meanie and you only want to give one or two to those people sitting next to you, that's what will represent what went out of Africa. So the gene pool that went out of Africa is you being a meanie and just taking two Smarties and giving it to your friend. And then those Smarties do their own little things. Eventually, they spread and migrate. And you only got two colors of Smarties outside of Africa. So within Africa, you have this exotic gene pool of diversity. So coming back to the scientific terminology in Africa, we see the most genetic diversity and only a subset of the ancestors who left Africa took with them that sort of genetic patterns that they would have had and have contributed that to the rest of the world. So what happened when our early ancestors left Africa to explore the unknown? Well, think about it. Sipping one of those lovely cocktails on a romantic evening, moonlight out there. Hmm, maybe <laughs> this Neanderthal encountered one of our ancestors. And of course, the ambience of the evening would have provided <laughs> just the ideal conditions. And I changed the slide, because I didn't know how it would work here. Normally, I'm quite radical and say, ask the question, did modern humans have sex with Neanderthals? But because I respect you, I say, did modern humans admix with Neanderthals? <laughs> what do you think? Yes or no? Yes. Stick the person next to you. Do they look Neanderthal? <laughs> well, let's see. Let's test that question. Fortunately, we're not left to guesswork anymore. We now have scientific information to help us answer this very important question. Before the, the modern DNA tools were developed, uh, we relied a lot on paleontology to tell us about the past. And paleontology, as you know, is dependent on finding specimens. Now, Neanderthals and humans lived around the same times. Neanderthals from about you know, 30,000 years 
uh, before, and modern humans were already around at about 150,000 years. Now, did they occupy the same geographic areas? Was there competition? Did they mix? Well, that was an open question up until the DNA technology evolved to the level of being able to get DNA out of fossilized specimens. And the Neanderthal gets its name from a specimen, a skull, that was found in the Neander Valley in Germany, in the Fellhofer Cave, and it's dated to about 40,000 years. And Savante Paubo, who's like the godfather of ancient DNA, his lab was the first to be able to successfully isolate DNA from fossilized material. Now, you can imagine the process of fossilization kind of damages DNA, because DNA is a chemical. You know when we say we're having a bad hair day? The protein of our hair is shooting in all directions. That is why you read on the shampoo bottles, what's the pH? The pH of the shampoo should be around neutral seven, otherwise if it's too acidic, it's gonna chow up your DNA, and your hair starts to fall and all kinds of nasty things happen. But DNA is equally susceptible to changes in the environment. And so, well, similarly, the process of fossilization starts to damage and degrade DNA. So it was a major, major uh, event in terms of the way the genetic or the molecular technology kind of evolved to the extent that Cervantes' group were able to extract DNA from the Neanderthal, and subsequently there have been other specimens, and today there are many, many more. I can't tell you exactly how many, because some people are still working with material and haven't really published it. In any event, in the early days, given that mitochondria was much, much more accessible to work with because there are many more copies of mitochondria in the cell than we have nuclear DNA, uh, Cervantes' group then analyzed a stretch of mitochondria from the Neanderthal and compared that with other modern humans. And what they found was, when it came to the mitochondrial DNA, was that uh, in humans, you got a nice little branch showing the relationship of various human populations studied, but the branch anchoring the Neanderthal specimens was on a completely different one. So there were two different branches coming to a common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans, and this point of coalescence, they dated to be about 650,000 years. So with mitochondrial DNA, now remember this is the story of the way females only are exchanging genes, there was no evidence of genetic exchange between Neanderthals and the human line. And they postulated that the human line and the Neanderthal line shared a common ancestor going back around 650,000 years. The story then changed in you know, about 2010 when the same lab published whole genome, now sequencing the complete genome of humans, which is about six billion nucleotides in length. And when they did this nuclear DNA sequencing, they found another interesting pattern. If this was the common ancestor, there was a branch leading to our species that's shown there. But again, the branch to an African individual of San origin seemed to be the deepest or the most ancient one. And somewhere along the Neanderthal branch, but outside of Africa, there seemed to be genetic exchange between Neanderthals and humans. So in Africa, because there were no Neanderthals here, there was no genetic exchange. But when the humans left Africa, to go into Europe and later into Asia, there was this admixture in the western part of Europe. So much so that in people of European and Asian descent, all the way to places like Papua New Guinea, somewhere between one to four percent of their genetic material is similar to that of Neanderthals. So look next to you now, remember I asked the question? Check them out, check out Anyway, you can't see the DNA, but you know the story. 
So then, let's come back to the question. Did modern humans admix with Neanderthals? Well, it's a resounding yes, but only outside of Africa. Individuals indigenous on the African continent do not contain or carry in their genomes any evidence of exchange from Neanderthals. So the story doesn't end there with utilizing information from ancient sources. Very recently, in a cave in Siberia, the cave known as Denisova, a little pinky bone, a small finger bone, in one of the sequences from an archaeological site, they discovered this little baby. And so now the technology was there. They crushed up a bit of that bone, got a whole genome sequence, and now we have a whole genome sequence of a Neanderthal to now compare to the uh, other studies, I mean, pardon me, of the Denisovan specimen to compare to Neanderthals and humans. And then if you put these sequences together, and one of the things we do when we have this sort of information, we align them up and try to reconstruct how the changes could have evolved over time, and we then build what we call phylogenetic trees, or trees giving information about the connectivity of the history of change over time. And what we see now is this very bushy part of the tree representing the modern humans, because we have many, many more of us around, and then the isolated cases of the single Denisova sample and a few Neanderthals. And then once more we find that modern humans and Neanderthals share a more recent common ancestor and now the dates have changed. With just the mitochondrial DNA, we said 650,000. With this genetic methodology, I mean, with the whole mitochondrial sequences, it pushed it much more recent in time. And the human Neanderthal branch is now separated from the Denisovans about a million years. We don't know which species represents the Denisova because we just have a pinky bone and more recently, a tooth sample. So there's no morphology for paleontologists to use to talk about what species it is. So we don't really know that information for now. And once again, when they obtained a tooth sample and replicated this type of analysis, once more, we see the Denisovans on a more uh, uh, deeper branch separated from Neanderthals and that of modern humans. So, so why do we use ancient DNA? Yes, we can study people living today, but how do we take that beyond the most recent common ancestor of humans? That's where specimens or species, what we call outgroups, not part of our own species, information can be used to show that sort of evolutionary trajectory from what happened before. So ancient DNA has revolutionized the way in which we have a window into the past. And so these are the two major types of specimens that have been used. And what has been found is that even in these parts of the world, although Denisova uh, specimen was found in Siberia, there's no evidence of any admixture from that specimen type into populations on the mainland but as you go into Austronesia, there seems to be an increasing frequency of Denisovan elements in people's genomes. How that happened is still a mystery. It is possible that we do not have sp specimens in this area that would serve as a template for a cross-reference, but something happened that there's this void of representation of Denisovan uh, elements in modern human sequences, but we see it much, much more in the Pacific region. So it would appear that in Western Europe, there was exchange between humans and Neanderthal. And as we come on this kind of vertical axis this way, Denisova into some parts of uh, this region of the world. There's no evidence of genetic exchange between Denisova and Neanderthals, 
So we don't really know what Denisova is. Maybe it's a new specimen. So I just wanted to share that sort of ancient type stories so that you can see how our understanding of the present is punctuated with what's happened in the past, even though specimens have gone extinct and no more exist, their information is retained in our own human genome. Now this is the other burning questions. Did, what did one Neanderthal say to the other? Like, you know, like, why did the chicken cross the road, stuff? Anyway, imagine them sitting together, pondering the questions of human evolution. Ha, <laughs> we would hope, right? We wish. Anyway, did they speak, is the big question. So, of course, I'm speaking to you. I have the capacity to speak in a language I'm most familiar with. But you're listening. So your auditory faculties and your brain cognition has to work in parallel with vocality. So what I'm trying to impress upon you that for us to speak, our evolutionary parts to be able to listen also had to be there. So the communication skills in one language, namely that that I am now speaking, is understandable by all. But you don't have to articulate communication by words. We know many, many, I mean, most of the biological world communicate by some sort of, some sort of sound. Now, very interesting with the story with humans, there was a family where there was a speech problem and when scientists were studying what the link could be, they found a genetic link to a, a gene or a group of genes associated with what has been called FOXP2. It's like a forkhead protein. Don't worry about the details of it. I don't know it myself. But it's called FOXP2, and that has been associated with the defect in this extended family where speech was impaired. And so they studied this a little bit more and compared it in humans to chimps and other primates. And what they found was that there was some difference between humans and chimps. Humans had it. The family that had the defective speech had a mutation in this particular gene. And so FOXP2 has been associated that not as not the exclusive genetic background associated with speech, but a contributor. So FOXP2 has been in, in, in the genetic field as something that has been associated with speech. And the fact that Neanderthals have it as well, the same pattern as is found in humans, was suggestive that maybe Neanderthals did speak, probably not the same uh, vocabulary as, as we have today, but they did have those elements of speech. Now that was based on genetics. And more recently, uh, people studying paleontology, uh, specimens, the particular hypoid bone, which is this sort of horseshoe-shaped uh, bone that's found at the back of the neck uh, that's supposed to anchor the root of the tongue. And in humans, that has been demonstrated to be associated with speech, the kind of vocal architecture that's necessary to make the sound move our tongue, the cheeks, the muscular architecture of the cheeks, and various other anatomical modifications that were required to kind of accentuate the vocal or the speech aspects. When they studied a specimen from Israel found at the Kebara cave, they noticed that in this Neanderthal specimen, it had the same horseshoe-shaped structure as humans. And so the paleontological information published by these scientists working in Australia suggested, based on the similarity of this bone structure with that of modern humans, that in fact Neanderthals probably spoke. Now there's a huge debate about this because there are some paleontologists who argue that perhaps this specimen may not be Neanderthal anyway. So I don't want to get into the debate but these were the two sorts of evidence supposedly leading us to the understanding that Neanderthals probably did speak. And again, unknown to me, the kind of questions that flashed in the preamble 
to me giving the talk asked, did Neanderthals speak? Or maybe I'd put that in the abstract. All right, so so much about what happened outside, how our species engaged with other specimens, kind of giving us some direction of our past history. But what happened in this exotic paradise in Africa, the kind of cradle of humankind? Well, we, we try to understand patterns of variation in the context of what we know from other narratives, like historical, archaeological, and so on. So in Africa, there have been many, many migrations. The most recent migration concerns those of people who speak the Bantu language. And the Bantu language is thought to have evolved in West Africa in the vicinity of present-day Cameroon and Nigeria at a period between three and 5,000 years before present. So all people who speak Bantu languages, just the language is thought to have evolved here would uh, spread across the equatorial belt to the regions of the Great Lake, and then a wave coming down south all the way into southern Africa. Another wave of migration happened from that same source along the west coast all the way to about Namibia, but didn't penetrate into South Africa from that western pathway. And there's also suggestions of people coming transversely across and intermixing. Now, how do we know this? Language alone can't speak to that. We now go to the archaeological record. It would seem that the speakers of the eastern stream had a particular way of doing their pottery, the designs. They practiced certain types of agricultural uh, crop utility, which was different from the western stream. The eastern stream had a homestead pattern that was circular with cattle being in the middle, whereas the western stream had much more rectangular homesteads and the organization of where the cattle was, etc., differed. So the archaeological specialists have used their toolkit to kind of refine the geographic roots of migration of the spread of this particular language group. And yeah, at WITS, we have specialists like Tom Huffman and other colleagues who know much, much more about that and so we now have at our tool, at our disposal, a tool with genetics to test these hypotheses. So if we were to sample people along the poet parts of migration and we compare the patterns of genetic variability, what do we see? And so that's the sorts of things that we keep ourselves busy with, uh, trying to understand, is there a, a claim of Something that started, if you think about uh, an aerosol can, you know, take an air freshener, toilet freshener thing, where you, where you spray it, you're going to get the strongest smell. But some of that smell molecules will penetrate the distance and you'll get a much diluted smell. So that's how genes kind of disperse as well. At the point of origin, you get like maybe the highest frequency or the most prevalence. And then as people carrying a particular genetic pattern migrate from one place to another, you'll get differences in frequency. So that's what we use to kind of compare patterns of variation from one place to the other. But in much more recent time, we also have seaborne immigrants from other geographic regions coming to Africa and contributing the genes. In South Africa itself, we have uh, scenarios where slaves were brought to the country. We have scenarios where slaves were taken from Africa, transatlantic slave trade to other parts of the world. So what we can do now with genetics is kind of answer questions associated with known historic events to see how well they correlate. Can we refine some of the answers? Uh, do they corroborate the oral, the oral histories and traditions? And so that's where the genetics plays an important part in us understanding better our past and so on. Now, we've recently published a paper where we looked at genetic variation in the different groups of Khoi and San people. So up until now, almost the, the deepest branches of genetic variation, not only are they found in Africa, but the people who harbor 
the ancient genetic signatures in the collective human genome are the Koya and the San, right here in southern Africa. So prior to the migration of people who spoke Bantu languages, southern Africa was occupied exclusively by Khoi and San people. How far back we take it is unknown because the use of the terminology is also relatively modern in construct. And so when you study groups living today who self-identify as Khoi and San and you analyze their genetic information, and this was done with a DNA chip of over 2.5 million uh, nucleotide positions, what we found was that the first branch in the human tree was exclusively represented by Khoi and San individuals or, or groups. And that takes us way back to over 100,000 years. So for almost 100,000 years of human evolution, the information that has been retained in living people today is still found in Khoi and San individuals. And it's only much more recently in uh, our genetic past that we start to see variation accrue in non-Khoi and San people. So therefore, Khoi San people are considered to be living peoples who carry the most antiquity, the most amount of information related to our recent past. Now, this is a busy slide, and it's there to wake you up if you have fallen off to sleep. And for those of you who are colorblind, I apologize, particularly the males who may have color blindness. Anybody in the audience? So you can all see the pretty colors. Oops, sorry, sorry. Normally you get about one, and I can't remember the frequency, but anyway, all I want to say, if you can't see the colors, is that when we come back to the Khoi and the San populations, they have a characteristic pattern in their genetic structure. This is another tool that we use to assess partitioning of patterns of genetic variation in human populations. And if you can see the colors, you would see in different regions. So for example, these are West African populations. The color is predominantly green. In East Africa, the color is predominantly blue. And in Southern Africa, the color is predominantly red. Now we can tell this program to at each stage get more and more and more stringent in the way it partitions it with these various levels of intensity. And the, the higher this value, the more partitioning you see. And basically, as we study global populations, we are then able to see the trend in which these genetic patterns uh, distribute a portion across populations. Now, this is very complex, and even us in the genetics field have difficulty understanding it. But all I want to say is we do have genetic tools at our disposal when we're looking at genome variation to ask relevant questions about where is that genetic variation associated, and to some extent try to answer questions as to what could have been some of the contributing factors that would have led to this diversity patterns that we see. Then just to summarize all of this, you may be asking, well, in addition to asking questions about reconstructing our evolutionary past, what is the value of all of this? Well, a famous evolutionary biologist by the name of Ernst Meyer coined the term or, or the concept that there are two histories to disease. If you truly were to understand disease mechanisms or how is it that we, we get sick, then you needed to understand two aspects of disease. The one is the history associated with the population, who you choose to marry, uh, migration, how you move, where you go to, the size of the population. Some, in some scenarios, you have founder population. So like, for example, if you take the Indian population, they came at a particular time to this country, and so we have a kind of linkage between part of the Indian subcontinent gene pool to South Africa. So there were some founders who came, uh, or uh, well, we actually numbered quite a lot in terms of founders, but, but there were a subset who came from, when, from where the population of now one, billion, uh, one million has grown from. 
So, so we have things of founder effect, genetic admixture, to what extent divergent groups of people who have been separated across time are exchanging genes. So every aspect of the population dynamic, which is what we are doing with our toolkit and my interest in studies, are equally important to the actual genetic regions under investigation or the genome history. How fast does the DNA change it? That's the mutation rate. Uh, are they mixing, recombining? Where are the hotspots? Which areas are uh, recombining more so than others? Effects of selection, some evolutionary forces that act at certain loci to accentuate variation in a particular direction. So these are some of the things that we study at the level of the genome. So the genome history, together with the population history is very important in producing the collective genome variation that we see. And coupled with population history, the sorts of things I've been talking about, history, language, culture, and so on, are also important in building the puzzle to see a better picture. But the genes don't act alone. I mean, every single one of us, we are part of the biosphere, we are subjected to all sorts of environmental things, gross environment, I mean, bigger things, natural phenomena, sunlight, UV radiation. But there's also that macro and micro environment, one cell to the next. And so environment is kind of multifaceted, and the genes and environment engage in a very complex way. So when you're trying to understand these very complex diseases, what component of it is actually genetic? What's driven by what's happening in the environment? These are the sorts of things we, 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 we struggle with to try to understand complex diseases better. So I also want to give some lip service to a project that we uh, throughout the country are involved in, and that's the Southern African Human Genome Project. It was a project that has been supported by the Department of Science and Technology, and it was started at around in uh, 2011. And through this, it's an uh, engagement, a collaboration across uh, several universities in Southern Africa. And the main objective of this was to develop capacity in an area called bioinformatics. We can generate lots and lots of genetic information, but the tools of analysis is what will keep the science sexy and awake. So we need to understand the manipulation of this sort of information. And bioinformatics is, is an important tool to marry with the genomic information to be able to excavate the information out of our biological material. And thus far, with the funds that we've received, we've been able to sequence 25 Southern African genomes, and it's, it's busy being analyzed and so we hope to contribute to the kind of narrative uh, within the African context about Southern African history in the context of Africa. So, so this project was, was conceived by Professor Michelle Ramsey here in the, in the audience and Michael Pepper together with a few of us who serve on the steering committee. And it is something we can own as a country. Not only does it help us develop capacity, but it also contributes to the kind of genetic information that we can provide and give our students and ourselves an opportunity to learn more from. There's another initiative uh, in Africa sponsored collectively by the Wellcome Trust and uh, the National Institutes of Health. And again, the project here at WITS uh, with Prof. Michelle Ramsey and Dr. Osman Sankok, uh, who is a um, leads up the in-depth network. This is a public health initiative with biologists. So this is a project at WITS, and the ultimate objective is to understand the genomic and environmental risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases in Africa. And at this point, I'm pleased to welcome many, many of uh, the colleagues from Burkina Faso, Ghana, and Nairobi, and other parts of South Africa who are part of this initiative and in the audience today. Uh, they're doing remarkable work of contributing to understanding the, the uh, importance of certain uh, genetic 
components to this particular disease. So there are many initiatives on the African continent that are health-based, but they can only operate on a platform of understanding the scaffold, the population history, and the population genetics. And that's where this sort of stuff, my interest is most passionate about, kind of overlies with the disease stuff. So if there were any skeptics who thought that we just fooled around and played, there is a reason behind understanding the population history before you can do this stuff. If you do this in isolation, you get no way. So much for the big science. Now comes the cool storytelling, which brings me to the title of the talk, Root to Roots. So how, how many of you have had a genetic ancestry test? Anybody? One, two, three, four, five. Sure, okay. Uh, if you were given an opportunity to have one for free, how many of you would want to have it? <laughs> Good. So since Christmas is a couple of months away, I'm not giving any Christmas presents today. <laughs> you can save from now to have one. Anyway, many people are interested in their ancestry. Even though the tools that we use, mitochondria and Y chromosome, have limitations, namely they only l give you you know, a particular lineage of history, to many people is an opportunity to learn something about their past that they would not have otherwise have known. So at this point, you have a little treat. A couple of years ago, I did a project with uh, uh, Card Blanche. It was a documentary entitled, So Where Do We Come From? And we'll just show you a few, a few individuals who had their genetics tested and, uh, or, or their genomes tested. Uh, if you just put it on this mode, full screen, and click on it. Of course, everything works when you test it, right? And so when it comes to the real thing, there we go. And I was very taken in by this whole Khoisan, this whole Khoisan exhibition. And one day we were standing there, and this tour guide came past, and she said to me, my boy, you're always staring at the Khoisan people. And I said, yes. She said, you must take it all in, because those there, those are your ancestors. <laughs> my mother said, absolute rubbish, we're German. <laughs> <laughs> you can see we're German. You can see there we're German. <laughs> Germans from retreat. On his maternal side, Mark Lothering's direct maternal line is Group H. Helena was part of a hunting family in the Dordogne region of France 20,000 years ago. My mother's going to be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what to think. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any hunting skills. <laughs> and on his direct male side, his group RM17, a Eurasian line. He also has exact matches in Germany, Poland, and France. Lord. <laughs> she said, he's not going to I'd love to find some wonderful um, Matabele princess as, a, as, a, as an aunt. I mean, that would really be nice. Peter Dirk Ace's paternal ancestor is RM207, a dominant group in Western Europe. It originated on the Iberian Peninsula 13,000 years ago after the last ice age. On his maternal side, his group L2A1. One of the commonest lines in Africa and associated with Bantu-speaking people. <laughs> and my mother, because as far as I know, my mother's story is very Eastern European Jewish, Orthodox. But then maybe, where do you think, maybe they came from, from Ethiopia, from West Africa, originally went up there, on the way to Norway, and drove their teeth up there. No word. Well, that's quite nice. So I'm, I'm an, I am an African. So, so yes, no people with black skin can point a finger at me. <laughs> and what about the father of South Africa? What does his DNA reveal? On his paternal side, he's EM2, the lineage of Bantu speakers, which is to be expected. 
your ancestry, just studying what you got from your maternal side would suggest an input from Khoisan ancestry. Madiba is also descended from the first people of South Africa, the Khoisan. Actually, people like uh, Harry, the stand brother, whose real name was Auchumayo, mm -hmm. he was uh, one of the first freedom fighters to go to Robben Island. Mm -hmm. I addressed a meeting of colored intellectuals mm -hmm. uh, in Pretoria when I was president. A retired teacher says, we know why you are so close to the colored people, mm -hmm. because you are a colored yourself. He could get away with saying something like that. I am aware of time, and I stand between you and the music, so do I have a few more minutes? All right, so you've seen that despite the fact that you can be blue in the face in a pre-consultation with people who want genetic ancestry tests, and you can say to them, well, you know, as a male, I can offer you two lines of... Uh, uh, lineages to trace your ancestry, the Y chromosome and the mitochondria. We test for nothing associated with why you look the way you are and that these genes are not associated with function that you would think related to diseases, etc. because we are using neutral regions that don't code for anything in particular. You tell them all the background. When they get their results, they have their own stories. As you saw in the case of Mark Lottring, think about it, with the Y chromosome, it's his father's 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 father, he had a Euro European lineage. With his mitochondrial DNA, he had that branch that also went back to Europe. Now those are just the two sides of the funnel. We haven't tested the intermediate individuals who potentially have contributed to his total blueprint, but we're not testing all of those lines. So when he got his results, he was like, oh, wow. So there's no Khoisan. Although he was raised, taken to museums to say, well, look at these people because they are your ancestors. Similarly, I have people who come to me and say, oh, now I can understand why my cheekbones are so high. Maybe I have some Ethiopian blue blood in me. Or, you know? so, so people take out of it what they want. And there are some... Uh, skeptics uh, around the country who think that as a, when we uh, offer genetic ancestry tests, we are giving people their identities. Every single one of us has a complexity about who we are. You know, in the context of this talk, well, I'm so-and-so, this is what I do, but you don't know anything else about me. So how we identify with is fluid and contextual. We will massage that information depending on how we want to portray ourselves. But when you do the genetic ancestry, biologically, a mitochondrial test in both men and women are going to tell you about the historic record of your mother's, 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 to some point back in the in the past. And then I always like just to use this, you know, this kind of analogy. Think of a tree outside with leaves. Every single one of us would be a leaf on that tree. That leaf is anchored to a fine little twig, to a small branch, and that branch into a bigger branch, till ultimately you're going to get to the main branch that comes off the trunk. And then you have a common trunk where all the branches kind of converge to. That point we will call the most recent common ancestor. So if I were to take a cheek swab sample from anyone, study your mitochondrial DNA, work out the sequence. Now, there are certain commonness, if you think of how a branch comes off a tree, that point where the branch comes off, associate that with a particular mutation, that all the smaller branches and the leaves must have that connect that's at that basal part of that branch. And then as that goes and splits and makes the tree bushier, each branching point is associated with a genetic change or a mutation or a variant. Now, by doing global sorts of studies, that's how we have built up these sorts of trees. So your journey 
starts from where that leaf is anchored all the way to that common trunk. So if there's anything you got out of the talk tonight, the two things you need to remember. That a genetic ancestry test is not equal to your identity. Many people misinterpret that, and then they scop me, Donna, you know, because I'm saying the wrong thing. I am using my genetic tools to tell people who they are. Who am I to say this and you belong to this? That's not what we're doing. We're using one small component. The mitochondrial DNA is 0 0.0000000 something percentage of the total genomic information. But because it has this unique property of being transmitted from mother to child and so on, it becomes very useful as a tool. So that is that part, the genetic ancestry does not equal identity, that's the first thing. And then also to acknowledge that we have limitations in these systems. they only one line. It can't tell you or reconstruct all your ancestors. So if you want to know pressingly something about your mother's father and you're female, mitochondrial DNA is not going to tell you that. Because remember, you're female, you're going to get your mitochondria from your mother, but the mitochondria is not going to tell you anything about your mother's father. So you, you, you have to have the right individual tested before you can you know, understand all the things in the past. Well, many of you would have been... Uh, uh, introduced to this, you know, breaking story in uh, two or three years ago now about the remains found in a parking lot uh, in the UK. That remains, which historians claimed, were that of Richard III. And so they excavated, they pulled out these uh, skeletal remains, they extracted DNA, and they got a mitochondrial DNA profile from that skeleton. So now the historians had already worked out about where this parking lot was a church in the old days. The genealogists had worked out some genealogy. And then they found two individuals who provided cheek swab samples living today. One was Michael Ibsen and another Wedi Duldich, who were female descendants or who carried mitochondrial DNA brought in from Richard III's sister all the way to the present. Something like 18 generations separate them. And what did they find? An identical match from these individuals to that of the skeletal remains. So this is the power of DNA, that you can find these sorts of connects, several generations separating them, using genealogical information together with historical data to kind of uh, uh, test whether those remains were actually that of where the story all started. Locally, we were also involved in another study which is quite interesting, and that is asking the question of who were the forefathers of the Lemba? Because from their oral history, it is claimed that they have come from across the water, uh, somewhere, probably in the Middle East. Um, and the story is that when uh, the Indian Ocean was used as a trading corridor, some people from somewhere had come to trade in Africa, in, 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 in Southern Africa, and then the ships didn't come back to fetch them. And so after some time, they decided, well, we're never going back and integrated in the local population. But in addition to that part of the story, um, Professor Mativa, who was one of the founding members of the Lemba Cultural Association, published a book where they claimed from the oral history and they had certain cultural practices that they associated culturally with that of Jewish people. And a colleague of mine, Mandy Spurdel, in the mid-90s, working with Professor Trevor Jenkins, who was the person who initiated the study. And interestingly, this study was initiated because of music. So we're going to have jazz music just now. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Frank Nabara from WITS, the physicist, 
His wife, Margaret Nabara, was a musicologist. And when she heard some of the music played by the lemba and the instruments that they used, she associated that with similarities to, to uh, some Middle Eastern populations. And since, you know, the old boys used to jol down at the Wits postgraduate uh, club, they talk about these things, and they got Trevor excited about going up uh, uh, to the Limpopo region to, to collect samples at the Lemba cultural uh, meetings. And so in around 1988, uh, some specimens were collected from participants at such a community event, and we analyzed it. So when I did the mitochondrial DNA work, I found there were the Lemba mitochondrial pool was indistinguishable from that of the other vendor and groups among whom they lived. Mandy Spurtle, on the other hand, doing the Y chromosome work at the time, at a very low resol level of resolution, noted that about 50% of the Y chromosomes that she studied had a pattern not s that was distinguishable from those found in Africa, but more similar to Jewish and some Indian populations. At that level of resolution, she used the word Semitic, which in modern day terminology would be the incorrect use of terminology because you're bringing in a language scenario and cultural scenario. So we prefer to say they were more Middle Eastern-like. So that, that hit the news waves because 60 Minutes and all kinds of people were very interested in the stories because now you're linking the Lemba together with the oral history, back to some Jewish connect. In the meantime, some scholars at University College of London, David Goldstein and his group, came and resampled in some areas uh, in, in Sukukuni land, in the Limpopo region, and they now used a more sophisticated genetic methodology, uh, also with the Y chromosomes. In addition, they sampled Jewish populations, and within the Jewish group was a group of the Kohenim, the uh, priestly groups among the Jews. And among the Kohens was a particular Y chromosome pattern. And it was the most frequent one. And usually when we see a common or a frequent trait, we call it a modal pattern. So they call that the Kohen modal haplotype. And when they use the same method and the same genetic markers, and studied the Y chromosomes in the Lemba, about 10% of the males were found to have this particular pattern. So again, more international interest in the story. And uh, we then, a few years later now, as the Y chromosome technology improved, uh, another group from Arizona, Mike Hammer's group, we're able to understand that Jewish pattern a little bit better. So if you think of a rake, how you have a handle and you have that part that pulls all the leaves, well, we had the handle and now we refined the resolution to include the, the part that gathers all the leaves. So they made a few more genetic markers on this background and they found that on one of the spiky bits was this Cohen pattern and none of the other ones. We introduced that higher resolution mapping, and when we did that, uh, we did not find that Cohen modal haplotype among the South African Lemba. So that was a very interesting study. At a low resolution, you saw one particular pattern, but the better the resolution, the interpretation of the data changed. So now comes an ethical question. How do we deal with this information? We've published a paper, but I think we have a responsibility of going back and engaging with the community. So now you have a community belief system, a cultural practice, and now you have the genetics. Of course, we are the outcasts, right? Because we don't know any better. But the, the, the point I want to get across is that you can use genetic tools to test questions or scenarios and then you have to deal with the backlash because you're now infringing on the human side of things and that's where the communication kind of stands up. Now, I can go on and give you many, many more scenarios, but I think I will stop just with these, these two examples and then give you 
an opportunity to ask questions. And I don't like doing this, but I'm going to skip a couple of slides. And then just to mention that up at the National Health Laboratory uh, uh, service, we do offer genetic ancestry testing. And uh, for those of you who are interested, you can contact either me or my colleague, Raj, who's here in the audience. And these are the costs that the genetic ancestry tests uh, would cost you. So if you are interested, those th that's the details. It's not forcing you, but normally people will ask me that in the questions. So I preempted it by putting up a slide. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>